Bonjour à tous. Oh, hello everybody. Thank you for being here for this last uh, panel discussion of the day. And the theme is media and experts. How do we dialogue? How do you uh, foster dialogue between media and experts? So we have Kirsty Savon with us, who is uh, to my right. So Kirsty Loken. So the translation should be working, Kirsty. Kirsty is perhaps not on the right channel. I can introduce her, though, can I not? So Kirsty has a big media group in Norway. And she's the head of the uh, governmental commission focusing on freedom of speech. Just beside her, we have Leonardo Curtio, who's a political scientist, a journalist, member of CISAM, attached to the Autonomous uh, University in Mexico. Then we have uh, David Lasvarga, who's an, a lawyer, an international lawyer. He's an associate of the Gente firm. And just next to me, we have uh, Laurent Gumier, who's director of information at France Television. So just a few words uh, by way of introduction. So that uh, um, so on this theme, media and experts, of course, there are different ways of entering into the subject. One is to start with the competition that we are seeing in terms of information, accessing information grabbing people's attention, and I think it questions the role of experts. So, you know, experts need time. Experts are professionals of their field. Sadly, we, we should have had a doctor with us, but uh, unfortunately, he's having to do a liver transplant today, so he couldn't come, our surgeon. So the role of experts. Um, has been undermined because of the, competent, the competition between social media and traditional media. So there are cognitive sciences that tell us that we all have confirmation biases. So the more information we receive that is in line with what we think, the more we want to read that information, <laughs> the more reticent we are to hear different uh, voices, uh, so uh, different experts. So often it's not easy, you know, experts and what they have to say. So is it good to always listen to experts? Uh, uh, social media are based on multitude, whether we're talking about Twitter or Facebook. If we take these two media, Twitter and Facebook are based on media effects. Uh, and that explains the domination of these platforms, the fact that we're kind of taken up in a flow of people who think like us. And that's very dangerous. It's very dangerous for the traditional media model, but also when it comes to what experts have to say. So the role of experts is difficult enough in traditional media, but um, when it, uh, there are uh, uh, opinions that group together, um, it's even more difficult for experts. The other big question is, so uh, what do experts talk about? So after the crisis and, and in the 2010s, we questioned the role of economists. We said that you know they were all talking about uh, banks. They work in banks. They've worked in the financial sector. They've not planned ahead. They haven't warned us about the risks that were on their way. And there was a big m questioning that um, affected economists, but we also know that these, this questioning also affected scientists and notably doctors in their relationship with pharmaceutical labs, pharmaceutical companies. Is what they say, you know, is it legitimate when they're being paid by pharmaceutical companies? So it's all of these questions that we're going to try and talk about together. And I'm first of all going to hand over to Kirsty, who now is able to listen to the translation apparently. I stop and talk for myself. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for the ability to discuss a, an extremely interesting topic, I think. Uh, I, I'm head of the Norwegian government's uh, Commission on Freedom of uh, Expression. Uh, we, um, we have for, we're a group of 15, 16 people that for two and a half years have been uh, diving into all aspects of, um, of 
freedom of expression in Norway legally and uh, not least within social media. And, uh, and we are about to deliver a huge report to the Norwegian government in August. So I cannot tell you anything about that uh, because it will be secret until the minister will get it. But I'm, I would like uh, to approach our debate uh, by, by starting in social media, uh, which I find extremely interesting. Because um, if we follow discussions on, uh, on freedom of expression and follow discussions on social media, there will probably always be something negative attached to that discussion. There are problems, there are some wrongs, there are some faults, there are, um, uh, there are rude people, there are hate speech, there are trolls, uh, also there are uh, echo chambers. And even though we are discussing all these things all the time, there is a huge democratization going on in front of us. We have never seen anything like it, probably when we started printing books by Gutenberg, but not uh, any, any other changes in, in the public sphere can uh, relate to what we are seeing. The voiceless are getting a voice. Those who, uh, who are not that good at writing or, or uh, presenting themselves, they do in social media, they misspell, they mistake things, they do wrong, but they are um, they're public people. My approach to freedom of expression is that uh, it belongs to the civil society. And, uh, and if we agree on that, uh, all, along, all the way ahead of us, there are huge paradoxes in the, in the development. For instance, when we're now discussing um, uh, the, the regulation of social media, uh, we see that uh, the regulation implies that the governments have more and more to say of our, uh, of our freedom of expression, because they're given power uh, over the, uh, the social platforms. Uh, and, and not the civil society, as it should have been. And, and those are really challenging things uh, that, we should, um, that we should be preoccupied with. But if we, um, if we agree that uh, we are living through extremely interesting times, extremely democratic times, uh, when we are able to listen to all kinds of voices, as you say, uh, all kinds of experts and not so expert people also, unfortunately, but they're part of this huge choir that, we, uh, that we're all uh, a part of. I think there are two, appro two angles or perspectives that we need to, to be very aware of when we are discussing experts and we're discussing who is it worthwhile listening to. And, uh, and not least all the troubles that we see on social platforms. And that is uh, to remind ourselves to look at all these things in a power and class perspective. I think lots of um, the challenges that we are discussing relates to the fact that there are people in power that are challenged by more uh, not so powerful people. Uh, and it also has to do with not so qualified people trying to uh, take part in a debate while being not so good at expressing themselves, not so good at spelling, uh, and not so good at understanding either. Uh, but if we try, if we start calling that trolls uh, or hate speech, uh, I think we are um, on a very wrong place. Even though there are hate speech, as I also admit, lots of it isn't, and lots of it we, we never mind defining what is hate and what is trolling in, in social media. So one perspective I think it's important to remind us is this. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, of course, uh, much, challenge, much more challenging, but still true. Uh, and that is that all the problems that we see in social media, all the pro problems that we see uh, with freedom of expression, was there already. Uh, social media is amplifying problems in society that was already there. Social media is showing the powerful, the problems that they were, didn't relate that much to before people got a voice of their own. Like for instance, Maria Ressa, as, uh, as you probably have heard of, the, the, the Philippine editor that got uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, by the way, uh, in Norway uh, last year. She, of course, uh, often talks about the problems that uh, social media creates in the Philippines, 
But I think we also need to remind ourselves that the problems in the Philippines were there before social platforms. Uh, so, um, the Philippines had lots of things to, uh, to deal with before people had an account on Facebook and Twitter. And, um, uh, and that is, uh, I think, a reminder that uh, I think the best, the best way to, to combat what we see as problems with freedom of expression is a general education. Is, it's, uh, is access of information to all people, so they're better equipped to dealing with, um, with the debates, with the facts, with, uh, with the points of view that, that we, that are much more privileged maybe, that can sit at conferences and discuss these things, uh, that not all, other, all are that, uh, that privileged. So, um, so I think that uh, when we are about to embark on a, an, on a debate on experts, I think we all also should remind ourselves that lots of things in, in the um, public debate is about feelings, it's emotional, uh, and that, uh, that, is, that will always be a challenge to the experts, I think. Thank you, Kirsty. So I'm delighted to be here at the table with you. So I'm going to suggest three points to think about. Uh, first of all, the national debate, the national conversation, and the consequences of the logic of social media and the superlative breaking up of social dialogue and the description of the media universe that was replaced by a pluriverse peopled with isolated discourse and sometimes insolent uh, discourse. So a political discourse uh, that is less ideological and more focused on identities. In fact, there isn't really a systematic discourse. So it's not exactly systematic, but there are messages a la carte that aim to seduce populations and communities who feel that they are excluded or discriminated against, who are a bit uh, cross and who are ignored. And these messages are built to the detriment of uh, experts, discipline and truth. So that these com communities couldn't care about balanced analyses. And that's why the role of experts has become marginal in the conversations of these communities. The discourse is contested, it's superfluous, and, and, uh, and it's manipulated. And a political discourse, an economic discourse and identity discourse, this is a, a, another point that I, I would like to detail, tries to bring together all fears and angers and frustrations, and above all, all uncertainties, and replace them with a linear logic that is hypersimplistic populations like their leaders because they reassure them and give them a sense of relevance and belonging and they detest uh, the theorization about complexity and sophisticated analyses and I can understand that their reactions against the establishment the academic establishment journalists uh, the meritocracy meritocracy is hostile. So we're not liked and experts are perceived uh, like CEOs beforehand in the class society. They are responsible for channeling inequalities. It's, you know, it's the hierarchy. According to me, it's important to understand that doesn't mean justify this society, which is full of fears and uncertainties. And identity neopopulism that is talked about in uh, the Americas, it's uh, it's like a weed in democracy. We need some kind of glyphosate or some kind of herbicide that might work. And our work is to um, separate the chaff, to, to winnow things through. So we need to think about the hot topic of t the times. We've got regressive utopias, as we're seeing in the Americas. We've got dystopias. So we have to adapt, even if that seems to be quite complicated. There's no shortcut. Adaptation, even resilience, uh, need reforms. And these reforms have to be politically acceptable. 
We've also got to bring down fallacious discourse and recover truth. Make sure that it's a central value, even if that's unpleasant. China, migration is here. China is doing what it's doing. And all of the problems that we're seeing today, they're oppressive. And, and what I would like to share now is a last point. We need to accept the idea that experts are not popular. People don't like us. But I think we need a little bit more flexibility. We need to be more flexible. We need to change what we're saying. We need to be more empathetic with the population at large. We need to adapt to, to the emotions and important topics of populations. Inflation, for example, is a percentage. It's a, it's a percentage rate but it's also a tragedy for families. And I think that the media and experts need to understand that it's a rate, but it's also a tragedy. Thank you very much. David. So normally the microphone should work. Yes, it's working. Yes, good evening. So when I was preparing uh, this uh, debate, I wondered how my experience as a lawyer could be useful to the debate. And of course, uh, this leads me to a thought. When we talk about experts, we think about legal experts, not just the experts that we can see on TV shows or social media. We think of the persons appointed by uh, courts or when there is arbitration to be done. How do we define these experts? If we look at an expert in common law, in the etymological sense of the word, it's the person who has proven their worth, somebody who has knowledge, who has something to say, who can demonstrate that they've got knowledge and they can share it with you. From a legal point of view, an expert, a judicial expert, is a person who has been appointed, a person who has been appointed to give an opinion that's going to help uh, with a decision. So we have two definitions then, two definitions that are not that different, but they are don't exactly um, overlap. So can we draw something out of that? Can we conclude something from that uh, so that experts who are being um, criticized today can perhaps get organized uh, so that they are less criticized. So there's a first um, remark that I can make. First of all, the, the, this idea makes sense, because when we're talking about experts, whatever the type of expert, a doctor, an economist, um, a, a, a lawyer, uh, or, or somebody in geopolitics, so the expectations in relation to the experts are the same. But the problem that is criticized is that of independence. What do we expect from an expert? Generally, we expect an expert to have knowledge to, that can not be questioned by the expert's peers. We expect the expert, because of their experience, to take on board different opinions, to be able to communicate and to take part in debates. And the most important point, we expect the expert to be honest, uh, competent and independent. So this is an ideal world that I'm describing, you will say. We need experts who depend on nobody else, experts who are credible, who are believed by everybody, who act as an authority. They have scientific technical knowledge uh, that cannot be questioned, and their neutrality is irreproachable. Now, in practice, uh, the dependency factors are multiple. Experts are dependent on the state because they are state nationals. They're dependent on the authority that they belong to. They are dependent on the company employing them or providing them with resources. And experts are dependent on scientific communities that they are part of, the networks that they belong to. And, and sometimes there are many of these. So when we think about all of this, and, and you know, it's something that applies to all experts. It's not new. You know, it's not something um, that has come about because of social media. Perhaps we can um, maybe talk about two proposals. The first is to say, why are experts so decried today? They're criticized for two reasons. First of all, because 
we consider that they are paid to plead for causes, and that's, uh, you know, they come up with arguments to plead causes because they're paid for that. But they're also being reproached to have, because they have a links, uh, connections with interest groups uh, and who are hidden above all. And that's a, that's a big no-no. So the main, you know, avenues uh, are those when we think about experts. So now coming back to what has been done in law and what has been done for ju judicial experts, people who are appointed for arbitration or for contracts. So, so my, the first avenue there to be explored is to democratize expertise. In other words, to strengthen pluralism and to import this idea of what, or what is contradictory. To use the jurisdictional model, especially the contradictory procedure, a confrontation that is organized between different visions. Can we not consider as desirable, for example, when we have ob objectivity, independence, impartiality objectives, to have experts, it's desirable to have experts who talk together, who present different views, and in all kinds of areas. So let's democratize expertise. That means uh, that we're respecting pluralism and the responsibility, the accountability of these experts while they're fulfilling their assignments. So it's an objective. It's not something that can be decreed. Um, but I think it's the first avenue that can be explored. We can open things up. We can be careful so that things are not as – it's not the social media who dictate uh, points of view. And the second avenue that can be explored is perhaps a little bit more legal. It's this, it relates to the status of the expert as a solution uh, of, to the uh, evolution that is taking place a little bit too quickly. So if we look at what's happened to experts who work on arbitration, and there are many of those today in economic life, there are many uh, statuses, charters, regulations, contracts with institutions. We can see a certain number of points, for example, that are at once very important, but at the same time correspond to all kinds of experts, whatever their speciality. So transparency about recruitment conditions and uh, an expert's qualifications. Where does the expert come from? Why has the expert been chosen? Secondly, there's the obligation for experts to uh, declare any interest that they may have. So. You know, it, it, it's about measuring how independent they are or how dependent they are. And this can be done in different ways uh, because, uh, you know, if you don't have a conflict of interest uh, with a more exhaustive uh, declaration and a CV that is, uh, you know, uh, restricts uh, the expert. So experts must also uh, comply with deontological rules, and this should be part of a charter, a charter that needs to be put up by the different media or different institutions. So when I talk about ontology, I'm talking about that of the original profession of the expert, but also that of the, ontolo the ontological rules, which may apply to the fact that uh, introduce himself or herself as an expert and is listened to as an expert. So in this deontology, I think it is essential, for example, that the expert commits himself to be loyal sincere to give an exhaustive vision of a problem, uh, respect pluralism, and therefore uh, and in, in, provide analysis, solutions, options, which is, not which is not necessarily sharing or supporting. So to lead simply to starting from what exists and of this uh, uh, problem, which is the world old, you know, the legal expert, insurance expert, whatever expert, being always careful, you know, we don't want to regulate the freedom of speech. This is where the danger lies. We have to be very cautious. And this is why I said uh, we're talking about soft law. We're not talking about binding legislation. We want to implement a new deontology charter and accountability of the various media, 
which most of them do have that, for and to ensure plurality and qualities that must be uh, that the experts must exhibit whenever they deal with public issues. Of course, the question is the media are orchestrating all this. They choose the expert they invite on the TV stages, and media are ver love to have uh, frontal oppositions, conflicts, which sometimes are not quite compatible with an expertise discourse. Tell us how you see things. Thank you. It's nice to be the last because that gives me time to think. But it's a problem because you've said a lot of things, and all my smart remarks have been gone. Are gone, so I have to be uh, short so we can have a discussion, enlightened discussion. So, being the journalist on stage, your special journalist on stage. I want to see how the three notions, which is the expert, the media, and the social network, how those three notions interact today, or uh, collide sometimes, and even sometimes happen to work together and produce something interesting. So I think the traditional couple media expert, which has existing since the media have always existed, you know, expert in newspaper, radio, television, selected by an editor. Well, this couple is somewhat damaged because the advent of social networks about 20 years ago completely exploded the first, uh, first thing, which was essential, which is and I think, the, in, my, in my opinion, structures, conversations, yeah, the traditional role of media to be the filter of, of collective, which is the, 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 there is a, an edition group, and they can decide, uh, having discussed, you know, uh, having discussed it, de de debated it, who is the expert and who is not. What has changed in the last 20 years that the entry ticket as an expert, you know, uh, you know, to, you know, well, it's collapsed, you know, it's the zero now, you know, anybody, everybody is an expert and everybody is not an expert, has the ability to actually pretend and to describe his, his or expertise, share it, explore, expand it, uh, uh, expose it on social networks. It started with the blogs 15 years ago. I was part of those who, blo who, who said, and I still think that blogs were great, actually, you know, we are saying early on, you know, it's kind of a democracy, you know, new democracy of free speech, opinion, views, and ability to say interesting things. And it's often more interesting that uh, some journalists can say it, actually, because, you know, it brings us back to 15 years ago when the, the blog experts or in aeronautics, in agriculture, in uh, or in technologies or, uh, you know, uh, came, those expertise came from real experts, actually, and who brought in uh, and gave citizens uh, additional information to what was given by the main media. And then expert journalists usually, and less expert than a woman or a man of, who's been an expert in his or her domain for the last 30 years. So this deregulation that we've been experiencing for about 20 years, it's once more the entry, the entry ticket today in the, in the field of expertise has collapsed. And unlike what you were saying early on, David, of course, when justice uh, selects an, uh, an expert, I won't uh, discuss the way the experts are selected, but anyway, it is based on, uh, that selection is based on uh, objective criteria. You know, a past, a body of work, you know, uh, uh, the ontological uh, resume experience, lack of conflict of interest, and so on and so forth. And therefore, the expert is someone reliable and well identified. Today, anybody on the national network can claim to be an expert. Okay, this is quite trivial. We all know, okay, all this is the fault of a social network. We, the media, we pure and virgin. You know, we never made a mistake. No, no. What has changed is porosity and the contamination between what goes on on social network and what some media, I'm not saying all the media, uh, some media practice, that is, they go and get on the social media people who claim to be experts, and because then they go in the media and then become 
Uh, I mean, you know, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, they've received the benediction of the media sanctity, and you know, and uh, they reinforce their pseudo statue of pseudo expert. But anyway, to be very simple, we go and get someone on the social network. He comes on the TV stage, and after that, of course, he is an expert. Come on, on the social networks, he will have more followers, and then will climb more expert than become more expert than he was previously. Does this uh, vicious? circle, this contamination between social networks and media, this is what uh, is uh, causing this kind of uh, uh, dysfunctioning, global dysfunctioning. But it is the role of, you know, what, what the, the, the editing group, you know, the ultimate responsibility of media is to resist, that is to keep working, not as if social network did not exist, but still keep working, check ensure traceability and check the reliability of the, the discourse or the rationale, lack of conflict of interest, you know, resist the facility of uh, fishing, you know, or picking uh, or self, self-proclaimed self expert on social networks. The second one, you know, uh, second one, uh, which characterizes the time in which we live is the amazing brutality uh, that we, ex we experience in social networks, a brutality, violence. Uh, which is that of, uh, you know, the Wild West, you know, a few years, years ago I wrote a text because I still keep that all this is a revolution, uh, beneficial, but it was happier 15 years ago than it is today. And I described this Wild Wild West as being the, the promising land that, you know, to imagine new content, to progress education, you know, uh, education, democracy, and so on and so forth. And for the Wild West, well, uh, you know, I te like, I te don't like, I dislike, I love you, and I kill you, and I ghost you, and you're gone. So it's total absence of feedback, you know, experience and ability to listen, you know. You do, you're being defriended, you know. So as we said, the ability that the media has to, to allow a uh, form of expertise to grow and to be discussed in with serenity. I think media today lack totally serenity. They have, you know, not all media, not all the columns, again, I'm saying it, but, and this is the second aspect, the second facet. Uh, third one, it is the, the, the era we're entering, and this is even more worrisome, it's even scary. Uh, by the way, I don't see the world in black. I have a couple of light, lovely light solutions, but right now, right now, things are a bit scary. You know, today we tend to think that impartiality, you know, the, the neutrality, which is the, the basis of the, 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 the approval of a journalist uh, within a, a redaction is, 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 uh, is uh, floating, going away. And the young generation, the, the youngest generation coming today in the newspapers, the media did not know the, the disconnected free uh, screen less uh, society and society without social social network because schools of journalism don't necessarily do well their work think that uh, well you have to be uh, to have to be brutal being engaged and sometimes uh, forget uh, to be uh, impartiality to be heard and to be useful the notion of media fully impartial media you know uh, which will have gi will give all the opinions you know you can listen and hear experts from both sides well sometimes tends to to be to dissolve, then we see now a lot of media today, or in politics and elsewhere, who are only talking about commitment and who give the floor to a certain category of expert and who never compare two expertise. Of course, when you say a lot of media, uh, there uh, ensure debate and confrontation, but there are many of media where confrontation don't, don't exist. All the experts say the same thing. They interviewed with, uh, uh, you know, with a form of uh, 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 form of communication militantism. This is very dangerous for the journalists. I'll stop now because I'm telling you that journalism will die, the media will die, the journalists will die, and I hope we can talk about something else. Okay, we have a reaction from Kirsten. Um, I agree uh, with Laura. It's interesting to, to listen that you, you get new thoughts on this. And I, I think for the point of clarification, I think uh, it's important to say that I, th I don't think we really discuss being an expert, but how to become an expert that is listened to. Uh, and, and that is what, how to reach out to the audience, 
how to get your opinion or your facts uh, heard and notified. And, uh, and I think that all comes down to credibility uh, and, uh, and how to build credibility, as, as David proposed, a, a charter. Um, I think it boils down to ethics. Uh, sometimes simple ethics like being transparent uh, and being transparent about not being independent, for instance, but, but also it comes down to if you're good at communicating. It was easier before because then the journalist can tell the audience this is a, this is a guy you can trust. No, no you have to, to earn your position on your own uh, more and more, I think. Uh, but then I also think that we should remind ourselves that it is an extremely privileged position to be an expert that people listen to. Uh, and, uh, and one should be humble about it and, uh, and not so much maybe criticizing people for, for not listening that much. And I also think that the lack of ethics from other experts are also destroying the possibilities for, for the ethical ones to, to achieve their position, obviously. Um, um, but I, uh, I, um, I do think uh, all this uh, will eventually bring back power to the edited media. Oh, you didn't see that one coming. <laughs> but uh, I do think uh, we, we have uh, had some years now when we lack the self-confidence in the editorial departments because, because of social media, but we see more and more that there has to be a position for well-edited, credible media uh, that, can, that, that can sort things out, that can bring trusted facts uh, around. Uh, but, that, uh, but that also... Um, depends on, on the, the journalists being good enough. Uh, so so, so it, I think, yeah, I guess this is the kind of question that we will discuss for years and years to come. But, uh, but I, I still think that people that, that have a sense of belonging, as you mentioned, to their society, I think it's a, that's a good starting point um, for, for building trust in the society and, and also that you have experts understanding, as I think, I think your remark was very good, that inflation is not a th technical thing, it's a catastrophe. You have to have experts understanding the way people live and what they, what they sort of challenge with. I'd like to mention two cleavages or two differences which, in my opinion, are most important for credibility of experts and media. We have to acknowledge that this uh, revolt against the elite is impacting us directly, people say. Well, this revolt against the establishment, it is also a revolt against the so-called expert, the academy, the national school of education, and so on and so forth. So we, we have to be self-critical of that. And if people who give their opinion to the media, well, it's not always an issue, an issue of, uh, of competence or incompetence. It's, uh, OK, you know, uh, you can say what you want about the economy, law, you know, debate on constitution, but if you're not credible, even if you got the diploma, but uh, your, your speech, you know, uh, is not good, the, we end up with a communication crisis. Here comes the second element I'd like to discuss with you. Bless you. So the ecosystem where we live, if we imagine a swimming pool, for example, uh, well, you don't have the pristine water on one side, and the sewers on the other side, you know, and the the gab, <laughs> the we got a swimming pool where we got truths, we mix truths and lies, and this is reality. This is reality in demo open democratic countries, and uh, which comes from the social media, but also. Uh, in media, there are a lot of interests. There are trolls are bought by gov foreign governments, and there are interests which build debates which are fully artificial, artificial debates, uh, you know, fake debates. And we are not here uh, building up a dialogue, a national dialogue with citizens, informed citizens who are pure and noble and uh, who have the best intentions. I mean, there are also uh, vested interests, somewhat doubtful when it comes to, you know, uh, and uh, behind certain trends. And we have to acknowledge that, you know, our ecosystem uh, uh, comprises a cohabitation between clean things and dirty things. So it's not just uh, of uh, signing charter.
water, of course, fair enough. But right now, you can sign a, f a sheet of paper. But if, you, if you're not credible, you know, uh, you first let's reconcile ourselves with our audience and with the population before saying now here we have the truth, here the the ver truth as our pivotal point. And on the other side, I cannot guarantee in terms of social network that it is the same thing. So. I really want to establish those two points, which, in my opinion, in a, a part start from the, uh, the merit of having a national discussion truth. Okay, the problem with social networks is that the borderline between the what it belongs to knowledge and what belongs to opinion is rather blurry, and therefore. What appears as true, something which is just uh, the fact that it is a shared opinion by a certain number of people who are together because, you know, you, you will read people who think like you. So they, there is no questioning or challenging of this truth to opinion, which is not the truth. So I think the main question in this, okay, we agree, we heard. There must be good journalists, uh, as Kirsten said. Laurent mentioned that uh, all media are not uh, playing on the frontal opposition, like, you know, it's no longer a debate, it's a collision. The, nah. So w what happens when in the media nobody is uh, r subscribing to a newspaper, nobody looks the 8 o'clock news on any channel, and everybody insulting uh, one another with streets, Facebooks, and other, and uh, if I may add, because this is a question for you. But in fact, indeed, there is the problem of self-proclamation of experts, what was said early on, you know, I published and this and that, and then the responsibility of the media who invite them on, on TV stages or radio st uh, studio. But we don't look at the newspapers. Uh, we don't read the newspapers. Look at the main news at seven, 8 or 9 o'clock. We don't uh, respect the res so-called respectable media as being the guarantor of integrity and domination of experts, whereas in the past we would respect if you were the expect invited to France Television or, or the Norwegian uh, news channel, well, you were respected. So I, I, don't, I hope I did not contaminate you. Ten million people still look at new uh, main news on TV. Millions of people are sub subscribing to newspapers and magazines. But you're right, trends are not uh, ramping up, they're ramping down. So uh, again, this is a story which is about 20 years old. You know, there is no frontal opposition between the social network and media. We are on the social networks. The question is how can we deploy our capacities, our expertise of a, a journalists to differentiate truth from false, fake from real on social networks, exactly as we do in our newspapers or in our, uh, in the, our uh, uh, editing me, me, uh, meetings, so we have to be. Agree we want to be everywhere. Well, do we want to be everywhere where the public is in contact with the information, the true, false, fake, real, uh, uh, per, you know, uh, uh, garbage or reality? So the ability to work on social network is a field. It's a playing field, physical field and the digital field where journalists have to go and seek and label and uh, sort, you know, do a bit of sorting, screening by saying basically in 50 years, the t uh, 8 o'clock news or the, 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 the main news, the, the news, television uh, news will have a different form, possibly. Maybe linear television, linear radio will not exist. That's not the point. The issue is, will there be uh, editing room where people will get and seek information? I don't want to be, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not negative. Uh, I do believe that television will exist because always when television uh, came, we people said radio will disappear. You know, it's a kind of a, a market sharing. You know, it's an arbitration that done by the that's done by the public as to the way they consume media. But of course, there is a generation gap. The young generation under 20 is glued to the screen, but not the television one. And that's not all right. The, what's essential, and we'll discuss that later on about the discover that. For me, the solution, well, it's not the solution, but it's, uh, well, the borderline between, we, I talked about the uh, Wild West, you know, the, the, the crucial 
point, a crucial point uh, to bear in mind for the last 20 years is to say that we should teach children, especially, to be informed and as we teach them to read. You know, it's uh, how to consume uh, information as you consume books today beyond the great efforts made by the Clemy, the media, in the, but whatever. To learn to get informed is something that for democracy, for our democracies, will be vital in the next 20 years. And this will uh, shift completely the societies either in dictatorship or will keep them on the right side. Uh, Kirsten, we'll to, and then Leonardo. Just a question. Who's, who will be... Who will be responsible for the pedagogy if you want to teach children how to get informed? Well, it's a political choice. It's a political choice. It's the way you will educate our children. Then after that, the parents. But the problem is that you, again, are there something. But it's this revolution started 20 years ago. We are one or two, three generations lost. I hope they're lost. I hope the coming generation will be taken into, we will teach them how to get informed like we, we were not. But for us, it's normal. We, we, de we deal with it the way we can. We, we had, well, not the youngest here, but we, we know a life when there was no connection, no social network, no internet. I'm not saying it was better, but we, we can handle it, you know. Uh, we still, well, OK, we got a couple of, of reflex from the past saying attention, whatever. But of course, a kid who's 15 today who's never known anything else, you know, who doesn't have the same references and mainly who is not in a family where there are books and who has the social, intellectual and cognitive resource to uh, educate the children to get informed and sort uh, the truth from the false or the fake from the real. There is a gap which is opening, which is widening. And in my opinion, in the political sense of the word, you know, it is urgent to reduce that. Kirsten. Well, yeah, I, th I do think we have to realize that there is, this is a never-ending battle to bring people on board uh, to try to, uh, to see to that we not so many people are left behind when it comes to, to, vital, to being vitally informed. Um, and, uh, and I must also remind ourselves that uh, those who were born around when social media arrived, they, they are now in universities. Those are the ones who are taking masters and bachelors at the time. And, and one of them is my son, and I see he's studying law and he reads Dostoevsky, so I cannot find it that hopeless. Um, I must also remind us that. I see there are young people here too. So I think, I think the world is always uh, developing forward, and there we have some setbacks. And one of them we saw recently in Norway last week, because uh, Jens Stoltenberg, who is the head of NATO, uh, he signed this agreement with, uh, with the members, uh, Finland and the new members of NATO, Finland and Sweden, and then suddenly the medias in Norway were attacked by Russian forces, Russian digital forces. Suddenly they were struggling to get the, the newspaper printed, which is, of course, a new kind of warfare. And I, I think what we've discussed mainly now is our human challenges, but, but then we have the not so human challenges. And, uh, and what, if, if something takes my uh, night's sleep, it's the uh, deep fakes, which I think is it's a logic reason for not trusting what you see in media. Uh, and, uh, and also the bots that uh, Elon Musk maybe is not buying Twitter because of, but, uh, but still there were always bots at Twitter, so why didn't you see them? But anyway, uh, you have these bots, uh, but then you also have this digital war, war going on. And, uh, and um, I would like to hear what you think, uh, because Norway has... Norway is a small country, five million people. Um, we haven't had that kind of warfare in our arena yet. But, uh, but how to deal with that? Those are really, really, as I said, uh, the true reasons for not trusting what you see in the media and the social media. Anybody want to react? No? Oh, so. We don't really have time. But can we perhaps take one question from the room? Thank you. I agree with everything that's been said, but there's one thing 
that also seems important to me, and that's the professionalization of experts. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, we have experts who no longer work in their specific fields. They just tell a story, and so they've lost the connection with their expertise. It's a bit the same in politics. Uh, when you're a politician, uh, you're everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So, you know, we're getting people to talk who are not experts. And so we come back to the question of legitimacy. And then there's this question of narcissism, ego. How do you change that? Because it's unbearable. It's always the same people, these professionals. And it's in all fields. They claim that they're experts and, and they, 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 they simply postulate. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I agree, yeah. There isn't a question there, though, really, is there? So I'm talking from the point of view of media, so it's up to us to resist that facility, to find the, the means when we think about somebody who we invite up onto a stage for a debate, we have to think, you know, properly before we invite them and not to just uh, go with the flow and say to ourselves, okay, let's just invite that person because, you know, they, we know who they are, we've, they've been before. And that's what we're fighting for. You know, public services must not be dependent just on that kind of thing. And we need to find the right experts. 30 seconds. Yeah, this is why I was saying earlier on that we have to set up a deontology of experts so that uh, uh, a, a COVID expert doesn't become an American expert or a you know, it's fairly basic. You know, you have expertise in a specific domain. So, and uh, so we have to have deontology. So, media, social media and traditional media. This is, you know, this is something that you've got to take into account. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to choose your experts, uh, and then you, the feedback would be better. I don't think we've closed the debate, but thank you, everybody.